Hello, welcome to another riveting, groundbreaking episode of B Sharp and C. This is your host, Artie Aster. For this week, I want to break down and just talk about the absolutely amazing saxophone play of Vanessa Collier. I've been playing saxophone now for eight months. Now, for those who don't know, I've been playing piano most of my life. And then I, in later years, I incorporated some guitar and trumpet into my play, um, mostly in the studio. But then I picked up a saxophone eight months ago and it changed my life. It absolutely changed my life. I fell in love with the instrument. It's amazing, okay? My favorite instrument. I'm already almost to the point where I'm as comfortable playing the saxophone as I am playing the piano. That being said, I came across Vanessa Collier by accident one day when I was at the Sios website looking for Sios mouthpieces, and I saw that she's sponsored by Sios. So, you know, there, she's on the Sios website as an artist who uses the Sios mouthpiece. Long story short, I YouTubed her, found a few videos, and recognized that I have fallen in love with her style of play. I almost wish every saxophone player put this much effort and passion into every note that they play, and you can see it in her face, you can hear it in the way she plays, and when you close your eyes and just listen to the way she plays, you can actually tell you're listening to someone who's extremely passionate about their craft. <clears throat> Let's get right into it. Just going to go to the beginning of this saxophone solo. It is not a short solo, so let's just get right into it. This is in the key of C sharp on the uh, saxophone, on the um, alto sax. The key of E major, uh, if concert, you know, but C sharp in the alto sax. And she plays the saxophone solo she plays out of the um, major pentatonic scale, but it is absolutely just, it, it's so nice to see that she incorporates notes out of the minor pentatonic scale. She throws in flat threes and things like that. Um, and then she plays out of the blue scale too. So she's incorporating three scales in her style of play, but she also is like a saxophone technician or mechanic. You know, when it comes to how she plays, she's extremely inventive and innovative in the way that she plays. Let's just get into it, man. This is a song called Love Me Like a Man. I believe it was written by Bonnie Raitt. I believe this song is actually a Bonnie Raitt song, um, but just listen to this solo, please. Oops, I hit the space bar and nothing happened. Come on. Work for me here. What's going on? All right. The saxophone solo starts with the band really playing softly and she just comes in with this weird flutter growl on a, a on the saxophone. Mm. Ah, her subtlety and how she plays, how she can play so soft and 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 and, and low and, and just kind of almost like vulnerable in the way she's playing. But then the note choice—it's like the saxophone solo is talking to you, you know. Hear that? And now she's doing it again. The flat three. So she's playing in a major key, but she's playing the flat three. It's really something. So anyways, I'm sorry for the for getting confused. So she's incorporating the flat three. You notice how she did. Na -na -na -na. 
And then she's so she's taking a motif, just a couple of notes, played in succession, and she's saying, I'm gonna to continue to play this. I'm gonna play it differently, I'm gonna play it faster, I'm gonna take out the flat three and just end it before that. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. She's dancing around some type of familiar sound. So the audience is like, they're engaged. This is familiar to them all of a sudden. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I keep turning around because my piano's behind me. I don't know what that note was. It was an F sharp. She's, oh, I think it was the four. She's playing in C sharp. That was the F sharp. It's the four. I love that growl. I love what she's doing right there. All right, so, so far, <laughs> she's playing uh, in a major key. She's playing in C-sharp major, and I've heard her play the flat seven already. I've heard her play the flat three. Um, so she's incorporating notes from both the major and minor pentatonic, which is exactly what Stevie Ray Vaughan would do, which is one of the reasons why his playing was so dynamic and so big, because he incorporated a lot. He didn't say, I mean, I mean, C sharp major. I got to play only the C sharp major pentatonic scale. No, he he bounced around. He understood that the blues scale essentially is the pentatonic scale or the minor pentatonic scale, right? With the exception of what? What do you have? Um, yeah. So you add you add the flat five, and that's all that is. The blues scale six notes. Pentatonic is five notes, hence penta. So yeah, so think about it. You can play the blue scale over this key. So she can play the C sharp blue scale. If she removes the flat five, then it's essentially what? It's essentially the C sharp minor pentatonic scale, right? But she's incorporating notes from both major and minor pentatonic which I think is really good, but it's heavy, it's heavy blues. She's really incorporating a lot of blues notes here, which I think is, is really nice. And she's following the chord changes. So when they play the fourth, she's incorporating notes that are from the fourth, you know, which is actually not in the major pentatonic scale, you know, but still she's, she's playing those chord tones, you know, so she's really just incorporating a lot here. Um, it's really great stuff, and her technique, the things she's deciding to do, the way that she's deciding to play, the, the, the emotion she's putting into it, it's just amazing. She's changing it up. All right, I know that I'm, I'm stopping it a lot, but this is an analysis video, so, you know, whatever. You know, suck it up. Okay. Okay, so that is a very common blues riff, right? But she doesn't play it once. She doesn't go... No, she hits it again a couple times. And you know, it's funny because when they teach public speaking and they teach people how to talk to a, to a crowd, they, they basically say, you want the audience to be engaged in what you're saying. So there are little things in your public talk that you need to do that are reminiscent of things you've already said. It's a form of repetition, but what it does is it makes the listener think that they know the information. It makes the listener think that they've heard it before. So therefore they pay closer attention, you know? And it's very similar to when you're improvising and when you're playing a solo, when you find a motif, you know, a couple of notes in succession that sound good, play them and then play them again. And then maybe change it up. So play something like it. So the audience is thinking, mm, I know this part. Well, you really don't know it. You heard it for the first time 10 seconds ago, but you're now you're hearing it differently now. 
So that repetitiveness is actually a really ingenious way to solo. It actually draws the audience closer to the musician playing their instrument. Oh, I love that. Oh my God. Wow, nice. See, repetitiveness. But now faster. She's going back to that. She was already doing that. Still doing it. Changing it up, though. Oh, I love it. Did you hear that? So she's playing essentially the same riff three times in a row, but a little bit differently every time. You know, it's an absolute ingenious way to play. I've seen keyboard players do it. I've seen guitar players do it. She is absolutely not just blindly playing out of the blues scale or the pentatonic scale. This is a well-crafted way of play, but at the end, I'll tell you how I also think if she wanted to, she could just make something like this up off the top of her head, you know, and I can tell that by just watching the way she plays. Okay. That's awesome, especially with the reverb on the microphone. But I have to say that woman with the glasses is half saying, nice play, and half saying, get away from me. <laughs> I don't think she wants Vanessa sitting next to her. <clears throat> Another 12 bars here. It's going to pick up an intensity. Mm. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So that was... So she goes to playing high G sharp, so altissimo G sharp to altissimo C sharp, and then holds the C sharp and also puts vibrato on it. And you can tell just by the way her body tenses up that this requires a tremendous amount of focus and actual strength in your throat, your tongue position, your mouth position, everything you have to aim everything perfectly because to play altissimo especially that high in the altissimo range on the saxophone you have to trick the saxophone there are no fingerings that oh you want to hit altissimo hit the double octave key no there's a regular register and then you hit the register key for the upper register and then anything in an altissimo range you have to trick the saxophone into hitting those notes it really wasn't designed exactly for that you know that you have to fool the saxophone into playing certain notes and it's mostly your mouth because once you get the fingering down the amount of work it takes to play one altissimo note for one measure is tremendous and she's doing it there easy she hit that high g sharp a bunch of times and then it really went into that she that c sharp dug it in did the vibrato and holds it for a few beats it's just and, and of course she does it this i don't know if it's this third time around with the 12 bars or fourth time around i want to say fourth but i don't know but she does it when the music is really picking up an intensity. So it's very appropriate. Again, how you write a good solo. She keeps 
hitting that high G sharp. And she's still being creative. Look at that. What the heck even was that? Oh, come on. Come on, that's awesome. All right, she's doing some type of claw fingering for the G-sharp. So here with her right hand, this kind of claw. So she's hitting that. I don't know where, you know where she's going. I don't know where she's where she's sliding down to. You know, it's hard to interpret the saxophone play on a piano, but she's hitting that high G, G sharp, and then she's like, and she's sliding down. I don't know how she does that. I love that. Whoa. I, I, you know, guitar players sometimes play high notes on the guitar and then they slide down the fretboard and it's like a boom. Right, and she's doing that with with a little bit of echo on the saxophone, and it just sounds amazing. And I don't know how she's doing that. I I want to learn that technique because the blowing kind of trails off at the same time she's she's fingering the notes. Ah. What the heck? So she does this riff. It's really cool. She does this riff and then and it's flat five, five. So that's a real distinct sound. Um, it's just, again, it's just really creative. Traditional blues ending. Ah. And she doesn't end. You notice how she doesn't just end it. She's still creative and doing innovative things and fun things with the saxophone as she's bringing the solo to a close. Look, this is very easy for me to say, and I'm gonna I'm gonna name some guitar players out there who are some of my favorites and who I can compare her to um, as a saxophone player. And they're big names, so I don't want you like, oh my God, you can't compare her to this person. You know, that whole thing. Musicians are musicians. Now, there are some who are just amazing. I think she's really amazing. Um, but when you're a musician yourself and you aspire to play a certain way or someone does something that you find amazing or inspires you, 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 you tend to strip away all the pomp and flash and you just look at the mechanics of it. You know, I look at David Gilmore from Pink Floyd and I, I love what he does and I think he's one of the best guitarists as far as writing guitar solos that's ever lived. I think he's a melodic genius, right? Um, but that's, that's what I think of him. 
and I can sit there and I can compare other people to him. In fact, I think that Vanessa Collier's style of play, ready for these three names? Jimi Hendrix, Stevie Ray Vaughan, and David Gilmore. Jimi Hendrix in the sense that she's innovative. She's creative. She's willing to go out there and make a mistake even to try something new with the saxophone. She's just so full of innovation and creativity and so full of excitement for the instrument that she's more focused on what can I do. She's an excellent player. I'm not saying she's sloppy, you know, but you know, it's funny. You know, Jimi Hendrix actually once said in an interview, he said, when I go out there and play, I'm thinking more of the next thing I can do. And I try to make stuff up and I try to be different every time. That's why I make a lot of mistakes. I'm not saying she makes a lot of mistakes, but I am saying that you damn well better believe when she gets out there on the stage and she plays, she has an outline of what she wants to do in her head. She knows for the most part, okay, I'm going to do, you know, 48 bars of this, of a solo at the end of the song. And for the first 12 bars, I want to do this. For the next 12 bars, I want to do this. I want to put that riff in that I did. And it might follow the song every time she plays. She might do things that are very similar. But I can guarantee you, she works on doing new things with that saxophone. There's no way you do all those weird things. She's banging on the side keys and doing, you know, you, you know, she probably practiced that at home, but I bet you anything, she practiced it in front of an audience to see how the audience would react to it. So I find her to be very innovating like a Jimi Hendrix, okay? I think I might've said Jimmy Page by accident. I meant Jimi Hendrix. Now, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Um, Stevie Ray Vaughan wrote his solos and at times he would go out there and play and do something. The sky is crying, that opening solo. You know it when you hear it, but he never plays it the same way. He can easily go out there and just play. Hey, we're playing in the key of um, B minor, Stevie. And he'll go, okay. And he knows the chord changes, one, four, five, understands how it goes. Maybe there's a flat six over here or whatever. But the thing is, he can play a solo over it without writing one. He can just improvise. I promise you, this saxophone player here, she can put on any song in any key and just play for hours. She speaks with that instrument. She's an improviser. I can tell just by the way she plays. It's amazing, it's wonderful to hear because that's how you just freely express yourself with your instrument and the creativity never ends, right? David Gilmore. David Gilmore wrote guitar solos specifically. He was like, this is what I want. I want the guitar solo to be a minute long. I want it to be, I don't know, 42 bars, okay? This is it, this is how it's gonna be. I want this and I want that. Um, well, I mean, I think 42 bars would be a lot more than a minute, but you know what I'm saying. So, you know, he's, he, he's, he's very technical about how he goes about writing his solos and pretty much they're the same way every time he plays them, but yet he's very deliberate and very exact about the techniques and things he wants to use when he plays. And he does play things differently depending upon the venue, but he's definitely a lot more scripted, but he focuses on melodic note choice. I think Vanessa's the same way. I think that aside from her being innovative and creative and aside from her playing off the cuff like an SRV, I do believe that she's very technical as well and, um, and scripted to an extent. She knows where she wants to go and she understands that I want to incorporate these notes and these riffs into this solo at this time. You know, oh, this sounds good. This sounds good. And I see that in her because she repeats riffs over and over again. And I think when you repeat a riff over and over again, it's because you've played it a few times, you understand how it sounds, and you want to engage the audience, you know? So I think that, you know, in that sense, she kind of reminds me of David Gilmore. She's very melodic in the way that she plays, but I actually consider her to be a little bit more innovative with her playing and creative with her playing like an SRV or a Jimi Hendrix, you know? I know that's saying a lot, but um, I've been playing the saxophone now for eight months. I've been listening to a lot of saxophone players. There were a lot of good saxophone players out there, um, but I 
instantly gravitated to the way she played the sax. In fact, there are times when I go to, you know, songs of hers on YouTube, and I love her singing. My wife really loves her singing. My wife actually, we're going to see her in February, and my wife was like, I never knew she could sing that well. She's got a beautiful voice. And it's funny, she said about Vanessa, my wife said, you know, Vanessa's really violent with that saxophone. And you can see it when she's hitting that high register. She's, eh, nah, nah. So you can see her body tightening up. Um, and then when she does these techniques, you can hear the pads closing on the tone holes when she's playing softly. You can, you know, she is a very physical player. And I think that that says a lot about her passion for the instrument, you know. So I will say that there are times when I've gone to her songs on YouTube, gone to the end of the song where the saxophone solo starts and just hit play and just watch the saxophone solo only. I like her songs and I like her voice. I'm just blown away so much by what she does with that instrument. And I'm amazed that there aren't a lot of other players out there doing that same exact thing. Now there are, like I think um, Leo P, the Barry player, I think Leo Pellegrino is great. He's very innovative. I just see her on a regular basis playing innovative and crazy stuff and loving every minute of it. So I think that we should be sharp and see Vanessa Collier. Thank you very much for watching. Of course, subscribe to the channel if you want. If you don't, I don't really give a crap. Um, all right. Well, thanks for watching. And as always, keep it groovy.